Yo, this is Alex Smile for Destiny, and today I have the great pleasure of speaking to Alec Ankiri, a real natural that I've been following for many years now. And I have to say, his content and information is amazing. So I highly recommend you all subscribe to him right now because he will get you right in becoming stronger. So Alec, welcome to the channel. How are you doing today? I'm doing good, man. How about you? Fantastic. I'm happy to finally be talking to you after all these years. So uh, <laughs> yeah. I want to kick off by asking you a very simple question. Who are you and what is your general training philosophy? I'm just a, I'm just an average dude, you know. Um, I stumbled into weight training when I was about, I don't know, 17, 18 years old. Originally, you know, I was a skinny little dude, so I really just wanted to put on some weight and put on some size. Uh, I kind of started getting that accomplished, and then from there I fell in love with the process of getting stronger, as well as kind of what I noticed it was doing for me from a performance standpoint. So, like, that's kind of how I started falling into the world of, of enhancing performance, like, from a sporting perspective. Just the the increased, not just the increased size, obviously the increased size is helpful in sports like football, and even in sport like basketball, anything like that, but just kind of uh, the the ability to run faster, jump higher, all that good stuff. So, kind of started from there, started when I, I fell in love with the performance enhancing benefits, went with it from there, you know, um, when I got out of college, uh, the first thing I did was get get a personal training certification, mm -hmm. but I ended up kind of, I fell into that world for a little while and then I kind of came out of it because honestly it wasn't really for me um, in, in the commercial gym type setting. So I ended up moving on from there. I kind of went into some other fields for a little while. And then uh, right around that 2018 time period was when I kind of started stumbling back into it with the uh, kind of the online fitness concept. And it's just been going from there. <laughs> awesome. And uh, regardless of what you've been going through outside of business, you always put your body first in the sense that you were never lazy and you always set higher goals for yourself. And year after year, you continually improve. What started off as, okay, I just want to be bigger, became this love for strength. So right. these days, would you say that it's really the craft itself of getting stronger, performance above all else? Uh, it certainly is the number one for me. I mean, it, it's gonna, it's always going to take precedence because, uh, I don't know, man. I can't – if all I was doing was going into the gym just to, just to sculpt my body, it just doesn't motivate me enough. You know what I mean? Right. I'm, I'm sure you're kind of in that same boat. So I got to have something to something else to reach for. So yeah, the the performance goals, the strength goals, whatever, they're always going to take always going to take precedence. But obviously, no one's not well, going to want hypertrophy if it, it, it kind of comes along for the ride. So exactly. <laughs> Plus, hypertrophy is going to increase your performance at some point. Exactly. You pretty much have to induce it, and a lot of strength athletes will have uh, specific hypertrophy blocks or just put some extra focus on it. And what's good about focusing on strength is that we know that muscle gains occur slowly. So it's not like you're going to put on all kinds of size in a one to three month time frame. Whereas the numbers, you do see some improvements here and there, maybe a rep or two, you know. Right. And it's just, it's nice to track objectively just by looking at the numbers. Yeah, I agree. And kind of what you were saying about the strength athletes going through hypertrophy blocks. That's something that it, with like Western, Western style periodization mm. has kind of, I feel has kind of gotten demonized in recent years. And I think that's unfortunate because it does naturally yeah. run through those different types of blocks. And and honestly, that's primarily how I program, even to this day. Like, I've started using that uh, that conjugate style program. Oh, yeah. I've seen that stuff. I, I know you're a fan of that. <laughs> um, but it, but for most of my clients, especially the the er, ones in their earlier stages, I'll still stick with Western style periodization just because of that, because of the different different phases that you can naturally run through with that type of uh, that type of programming. Yeah, or periodization aside, just the act of getting bigger and building a base off that yeah. will allow you to be stronger in the long run. And we see many sure. bodybuilders who are getting into powerlifting that reach some pretty elite totals in a short yeah. amount of time. That's true. And that's kind of in some of my recent videos is a concept I've tried to kind of convey because I think people, some people have gotten the wrong idea about what my overall message is, kind of saying that you know, hypertrophy is completely unnecessary or something like that, which has never been what I've been saying. I've always tried to paint the picture of it, of them being complementary goals. Strength supports hypertrophy, hypertrophy supports strength, and it both will be capped. Both will hit a hard ceiling if you are never focusing on the other one. Exactly. So, and, and for you, I believe you've competed in different weight classes in powerlifting. And probably the main reason for upping a class is hypertrophy, right? 
Yeah, yeah. You're just sometimes, you know, you just find yourself heavier and uh, you just don't want to, you don't necessarily want to cut the weight or you can't cut the weight, honestly. And so I did, uh, my first meet I did was 148. I was sitting around 157, 158, walking around. So I cut down pretty easily. The best meet I ever did, I, I think it was the best meet I ever did, I ended up competing at 165 as a light 165 because I had been walking around at about 165, maybe mm. a little bit lighter than that. And I wanted to get to 148, and I I failed. I failed my weight cut, so I kind of <laughs> gave up. I gave up halfway through, and I just competed as a light 165. But yeah, the the point stands. I was a little bit heavier, and that was enough to make it just push me up a class. That was in sleeves, and I hit 523 on the squat. Uh, 308 it was 140 kilogram bench and then um 556 deadlift so it was a 1388 total overall those are respectable numbers and what's cool is that you're not just a powerlifting enthusiast in the sense that you emphasize a lot of stuff and even when i go on your page which i'm going to flash up on the screen for everybody to see there's a lot of accomplishments there and the whole thing is it's on curia elite fitness right and you're an athlete first and it's about right general strength and performance and being this well-rounded badass right yeah and that's uh that is something that i've tried to convey especially in recent years because i got so i i kind of started out that way like i was saying i kind of got started with a performance mindset and then i did pigeonhole myself into powerlifting for like a year or two in that like it was like 2014 to 2016 that time period and then i kind of got actually getting into youtube i got into youtube shortly after that and that was when it kind of like kind of brought me back to my roots the way I see it. It got me to expand right, myself right. and expand everything that I was doing. And I've really just run with it from there, especially with the conjugate training that I've been doing recently. That's kind of helped open things up for me a little bit more. I've, I've really been enjoying it, actually. Right. So, yeah, it's just i have just try to be as well-rounded as possible. I do. I've talked about that hybrid athlete concept. That's a big thing for me. So, yeah, I'm here Elite Fitness. <laughs> I love it, man. And uh, since you just mentioned – the conjugate system. Uh, I do have a lot of questions to ask you about that because obviously that's how I train as well. And I think it's a great way to train for general strength and it's overall fun. So yeah. I want to know, also we do it differently from the traditional approach. So sure. what is your generalized template? I've kind of combined aspects of the, the athleticism concepts with the conjugate. So instead right. of seeing me ever do like a speed squat or a speed deadlift, You'll still see me do like I would call it pseudo dynamic work. So you'll see me do like those high pulls, or you'll see right, me do right. snatch or kettlebell swing, or even just do jumping, do uh, jump variations, anything like that. So I'm always still going to try to be doing something explosive, something mm -hmm. dynamic, and I feel that satisfies that dynamic effort component. Not not in a fashion specific to powerlifting, as the system was originally designed, I believe, specific to powerlifting, uh, but it satisfies it in a general, a more general fashion. Um, for the max effort work, what I'm doing right now, I'm kind of focusing on a squat and then an overhead press. So I'm doing two max effort sessions per week. One will be squat based, one will be overhead press based. And honestly, I'm just running through <laughs> different variations, man. I'm, I'm really just having fun. I'm kind of messing around with it, just running through a bunch of different stuff, seeing how different exercises feel. Um, it's been working well so far. And then over the summer, what I was kind of doing, that was kind of when I started with the conjugate stuff. I had been doing uh, some different dip, heavy dip variations as well as heavy chin-ups. So I ended up hitting a chin-up PR in like August or something. Well, I hit a string of PRs, but I hit my be absolute best one in like August. I did uh, 150 pounds. So that was a direct result of the conjugate, the conjugate style training. That's awesome. Yeah. And then I guess the final component is kind of the rep, the repetition work. So those first two sessions in my week, in my training week, I'm doing it a four time per week upper lower split. So the first two are the heavy days. The last two are the volume days. So then in the volume day, I'm basically running the same through the same pools of variations, but not the one that I was doing earlier in the week. Right. So like I did a heavy front squat earlier in the week. Then maybe I'll do belt squats for volume later in the week. If I did a pin press, then I'll do uh, a Z press for volume, something like that. That that yeah. kind of thing. so just a lot of a lot of rotation, maybe more than is ideal or optimal for certain people, but it's working well for me right now. I think part of the reason for that is the the base that I have is allowing exactly. me to kind of 
expand and run through a lot of different things and, and still have it actually be beneficial rather than detrimental. Yeah. I think it's fascinating how you're able to adapt it to any goal. So yeah. you had been using it for weighted dips, chin-ups, now overhead press and squat. And it, it just goes to show that it's not a powerlifting system. It's, no, it has no. many general applications and you decide what you want to do. And it is fun doing different variations and just seeing your, your strength just go up, 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 up. It might not be the fastest progress on the specificity scale, yeah. but you still get results in the end. Also, I find that the way you do it is similar to me, except I don't um, include much of the plyometric aspects for regular lifting. But if I were more serious, I would do it exactly the way that you do it. I think dynamic effort is a little bit overrated. Sure. To be honest, I'd rather do like high pulls and cool stuff like that or plow um, box jumps. Right. No, I agree with that. I, I kind of felt that way when I first heard about the system many years ago it was kind of I tried it. I tried the dynamic stuff and I didn't feel that I was getting anything out of it. And I will I will say a part of that would be due to my my own inexperience, my own. OK inability to get something out of that style of work. And I think that that same rule would apply to most people who are newer in their journey. I think that as you become more experienced, you could potentially get more out of a speed deadlift style work or speed squat style yeah. work, kind of thing, especially probably with accommodating resistance being utilized correctly. So you're, yeah, you're probably right about that. And in my opinion, speed work does work but it needs to be executed correctly. And um, I did do an interview with Matt Wenning like three years ago, and he said that people are using too high of percentages. So the classic 50, 55, 60 was designed for people who wear gear. Okay. If you're a raw lifter, you got to drop it down to 30, 35, 40. Interesting. You know? And he was saying how he's like a five, 600 pound bencher and he uses 185 pounds with mini bands. So he's like, when I see a guy who's half my strength doing that, I know that he messed up the speed work. So right. there's a lot of misinformation for sure. Right. But um, in terms of percentages, how do you waive your system? Is there like, uh, I know with your clients, you use a lot of linear periodization, but for yourself, is there a specific method like three week waves, or upping percentages by like 5% a, uh, a week or anything of the sort? Or is it really just double progression and rotate when you feel like it or when progress stalls? In terms of the max effort work, primarily, you're, you're referring well, to? Well, max effort, I'm assuming you just change it every week, uh, and it's a different variation, right? But what about the volume work? Like the all volume your work, so this is probably where I'm diverging more so from the regular system, because I'm also – I'm also rotating the volume work very on a very frequent basis as well. Yeah. So I I don't know how long I've been doing it with the the overhead press bias, uh, maybe a month, a couple months now, um, some eight weeks or something like that. So I've only seen the the volume on the volume day. I've only seen each specific variation maybe twice at this point. So I'm still I'm still I'm basically I'm employing the max effort rotation concept on the volume. Yeah. And that may not be ideal. I don't know. I do too. <laughs> <laughs> so, so basically, I haven't really, I haven't really finalized that into like a formal progression gotcha. stuff just yet. I'm go, I will because I'm, I'm going to make a conjugate program and I'm going to release it in 2022. So I'm going to have it all like shored up. Basically, I'm, I'm kind of figuring out how I think everything works best right now. Um, but, but as it stands, what I kind of been doing is, uh using AMRAP style sets on the volume day. So I'll start either pyramid or a reverse pyramid. So depending on the exercise, if I think that the, the particular one lends itself better to a reverse, then I'll warm up to a particular weight. I'll AMRAP at that weight, cut 10%, hit another set in that rep range, right. cut 10%, hit one more set, that kind of thing. If I think the exercise lends itself better in reverse, then I'll do the opposite. So I'll yeah. start from the bottom and go up. No, that's a classic approach for sure, especially if you're not going to do dynamic effort. Right. So on a volume day, you can begin your, your session with a bench press, reverse pyramid style, and then you just do your regular accessories where it's not really programmed per se. It's just generalized um, sets and reps, you know? Yeah. So do you use specific percentages, like 70% off a training max or 50%, or is it auto-regulated because you've been, this, you've been in this for so long that you kind of know what you got yeah. with? It's more auto-regulated, at least with me. Um if I were to give give the concepts, program the concepts for somebody else, 
I would start with I, I would start mostly with a pyramid style. So with the pyramid and as opposed to reverse. So like when, when I reverse pyramid, I basically say, I think I can do this weight 10 times. Right? right. So I go up, I warm up, I start with that weight and then the chips fall where the chips fall, usually pretty close to where I thought they would. Right. Um, if I'm programming for somebody else, we can do that. We can do that down the road once we kind of have a good idea of how they respond to certain lifts or or what kind of reps they can get at certain just true, estimated true. percentages. If you were just starting, though, just have them do a regular pyramid. So just put 50 percent on the bar, just something very, very easy. Knock out a set of 10, add 20 pounds, do the same thing, add 20 pounds and do the same thing. Just, just do it until you find that tough set of 10 or whatever, whatever you're shooting for on that day where you think maybe – okay, there was one or maybe two reps in reserve here. That'll be the top set. Gotcha. That, so that kind of, it's auto-regulation, and it kind of lets you work from a starting point of, well, I have no idea where I'm starting, you know? So then on the topic of auto-regulation, you just mentioned uh, one to two reps in reserve. Mm-hmm. What is your general, is that usually what it is? Or do you keep it up to three, four reps in reserve? Is there a, a waving system on- of that too, or...? Uh, it depends on what we're going for. So, and it depends on where we are in the cycle. So like okay. if we're starting off, we're just getting going. It can be really easy. You know, we, it can be, okay. I think I were three, maybe even four reps in reserve on, on this top set. Even. Yeah. But as we move through it or down the line, if we want to give ourselves some room to grow, we'll start, we'll start cutting it closer and closer to the ceiling, that kind of thing. Okay. Like a classic, uh, Dr. Mike style. Yeah. So then, um, <laughs> Yeah. On the topic of addressing muscular weaknesses, how do you go about doing this with your conjugate system? Is it through just using specific variations or isolation work, uh, increasing volume? How would you go about that? And how do you assess well, them? It's going to vary. So it, for starters, it mat- what, the goal, what the goal of the client is obviously matters. If we're, say – Say that we have a guy who wants to increase his barbell back squat, right? Just the basic idea. Then you can just watch how the body responds once the weight starts to get heavy. So if we see that the upper back has a tendency to round over, we might know, okay, that's that's pretty simple, upper back weakness. If we see that the hips are popping up early, especially as fatigue sets in or once the weight gets to a certain percentage on the bar, then we know, okay, maybe we want to hit some more isolated quad work or, or or higher rep accessories, just just going for quad hypertrophy, that kind of thing. If we see a, a rounded back on the deadlift, hip extensors more so is where I would where I would lean. So I would start looking at things like hyperextensions, RDLs, good mornings, like more classic hinges, just to try to bring up the posterior chain a little bit. And then gotcha. uh, yeah. Yeah, so it's just generalized weak point training. So yeah. then um, in terms of muscular weaknesses uh, for strength athletes, which ones you kind of just alluded to right now with the posture chain, but what are the most common areas that really need addressing for most people? Like you can't get enough work for them. Can't get enough work. Uh, upper back, glutes, uh, <laughs> hamstrings. But I think I think the ones that everybody kind of knows is for strength athletes in particular. If uh, – if we wanted to branch it out a little bit more, I've started using just for more generalized training or for performance training. I've started using a lot more concepts of like the the knees over toes guy. Right. Stuff he's talking about. So in my own training, as well as in a lot of other people's in, in my clients, I've started using a lot of hip flexor work, um, tar- target those muscles specifically, uh, even some isolated calf work. Um, I've started shit. I've started experimenting with um all all different facets of the of the functions of the hip. So I, yeah. I have had some hip problems in the past, and I've kind of been able to move past them pretty effectively by targeting the different functions of the hip. So I've started using um, some they're called Copenhagen planks. So that kind of it's kind essentially a side plank where you use the adductors to hold yourself up uh. in a side plank position. But then I've started incorporating that dynamically. So I'm lowering myself with the adductor and then lifting myself back up with the adductor. So I'm hitting it, hitting that, that in that fashion, I'll use a variety of different abduction ones. You can also do an, a, a side plank that hits a, the abduction aspect of the hips. Uh, and then I just talked about the flexion. Obviously we're hitting hip extension all the time. So I've kind of started targeting the isolated functions of the hip hips a lot more as well. But again, it comes for me anyway, it comes 
last. So like I'm starting, I go power, then I go strength, then I go hypertrophy, and then I go with these isolated functions. So it's never, it's still not like taking priority, but I have noticed a, a lot of benefit in incorporating that type of stuff. Not, not just in how you, how you move overall in general, but also in how you feel. And I've, I've gotten a, a few clients back. I took this one dude back from the freaking grave, man. He couldn't do anything. And now we got him. He was basically shocked like, at the improvement we've made in how his back, his lower back and his hips feel by adding in some of that type of stuff, the, the isolated wow. hip flexor work. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It is cool. And I think uh, a lot of times people do have hip pain, not hmm. because the hips are overly tight, but overly weak. And overly weak. in many cases, just direct work is going to fix the problem like weighted leg raises or more uh, adductor emphasis, like you just mentioned. Right. And in general, these little movements that people don't think about too much can really be game changers and oftentimes correct weaknesses that hold you back on the main it's, movements. Like I, just to say, uh, me too, I follow um, knees over toes guy and I'm thoroughly impressed with what he's put out because you would think, oh, this is gimmicky stuff, but then you experiment yeah. with it and it's, oh <laughs> damn, this actually works, right? And uh, the Nordic curls in particular, I don't know if you're able to do those, but bro, they <laughs> are, demolishing and i've been working on them you know right. uh doing the eccentrics doing with the bands and i can already feel my hamstrings are transforming right uh, not literally in the sense that the, the, the muscles are already popping out and stuff like that but i get less sore when i do hip hinges and i feel generally more recovered because my hamstrings are just becoming stronger and i think right. even the tibialis raises uh the sissy squats like that will bulletproof your knees and i'm yeah. up to doing them weighted no problems whatsoever so i think like more movement variability is, is key for anyone who wants to stay safe in the long term and just have different performance elements. No, I agree that that has really kind of been the game changer for me in, in recent years, especially has been incorporating still still kind of sticking with my roots, but just incorporating not not only more variability in those primary movements, but also just a boatload of different sorts of smaller types of exercises, more isolated type of work. Um, with the Nordic curls for me, so I had gotten to a point a few years ago where I was I was doing uh I was doing them without on the floor without any assistance. I right. kind of got away from them. So what I've started doing in recent history, I have that little that it's like it's a, technically it's a flat hyper extension, a ninety degree not a, a yeah ninety degree hyper, but I can move it. I drilled a new hole so I can move it in close enough and I can actually use it as a glute ham raise. Oh, nice. um, so I'll use that. That's what I've been doing recently. And I've just been really focusing on the negative, uh, c controlling that four or five seconds. I started adding some weight, hold it on the back of my head, control the negative, drop the plate and then pop back up. Uh, that's been a lot of fun too. And yeah, that exercise, you can't mimic it. You can't beat it in terms of the hamstrings, in terms of the, uh, the knee flexion aspect of the hamstrings, which is often neglected. Oh, a hundred percent neglected. That's why a lot of guys, um, you would think, if you have knee pain, you need stronger quads. And that is true in the sense that you need to, you know, strengthen that VMO through a deeper range of motion. But oftentimes, weak hamstrings is a great contributor. And that's right. why uh, some really good strength coaches recommend doing band leg curls on off days just to get some blood flow and hypertrophy right. that connective tissue. Yeah, that's one thing I'll use is band. I, I actually wrote an article on that exact topic, not not about the band nice. specifically, but about the weak the weak knee flexion of the hamstrings. I literally called it. We all have weak hamstrings. <laughs> um, but yeah, so like that that thing specifically, I do use the band leg curls uh, with a lot of people. It's just a handy handy variation, yeah. obviously, because you can do it from anywhere. I like uh, the I call them two one leg curls is another one because the focus. The main focus, in my opinion, should be on the eccentric, the, the eccentric knee flexion strength. At least to my knowledge, the research shows that that is actually more important than the concentric strength, at least where uh, not tearing a hamstring is concerned. If you're doing like sprinting, a lot of sprinting and that kind of thing. So the two one leg curl, I got distracted. The two one <laughs> leg curl is you use uh, two legs to lift, one leg to lower. So you get to focus more on the eccentric ah, things. Yeah. That is freaking cool man so then on this topic of eccentric training then uh wouldn't like rdls and good mornings and just stiff legs that would also help a lot in energy prevention right given the the men's stretch you get the bottom it does and i think that's a component of it but the difference is so when you're hinging you are stretching the hamstring through through the hip through the the proximal the origin right. but at the top right when you're flexing the knee 
it it becomes the bottom. You can't see my legs, but it <laughs> it becomes the bottom. It becomes the it becomes more down at the knee, and so you don't really hit that uh that tendon if you're doing hinging variations. That, gotcha. That tendon at the bottom. So that's kind of the main difference. We get away from that. Like honestly, I ignored knee flexion as a strength athlete. I ignored knee flexion. <laughs> Hey, so did I, and it ended up with me having uh, pathetic weak hamstrings, and now <laughs> I'm having to do catch up all these years later. So right. <laughs> I agree that it's very important to uh, treat that seriously, either through gl glute ham raises or uh, leg curls, Nordics, whatever you so desire. Right. And even you, you can make the argument for the quads as well. Uh, like I used to be anti leg extension. Um, I still don't do them, to be honest. But I can see the merit, you know, in hitting the the, the uh, rectus femoris in the shortened position. Or just like uh, trying to take out uh, the posterior chain as much as possible and really right. focus on squats, like with sissy squats and Spanish squats, little variations like that. Yeah, that's kind of the ironic part. I think that uh, we all used to be anti a lot yeah, of things. A lot and of things. We kind of moved <laughs> forward and we become a lot less anti of everything. <laughs> Man. Dude, the longer I trained, the more I realized like I didn't know shit back then. Not in the sense that we were idiots, but there just there was there was a lack of information and now sure. the general consensus appears to be that there's no real bad exercise per se it's just right. load management and you have right. to properly load the tissues over time and there are some people who make videos saying never do this exercise and they try to fear you uh because <laughs> they say you're gonna get hurt but you know if you actually train them long enough you'll probably find that no this is fine and that's been my experience with good mornings by the way uh, I started with a 45 pound bar and now I'm doing 240 for reps and it helps my RDLs. I've noticed immense growth in my glutes and hamstrings. My lower back is freaking titanium right now, which is crazy because I used to have strains all the time. It was the weakest link. If I would listen to these guys saying, oh yeah, it's in the graveyard now, we have never gotten <laughs> to this point. Yeah, I think we need to try to move away from concepts like that, from concepts of there even needing to be an exercise graveyard. Yeah. And that's not to say that every exercise is, is fucking A1 or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, for sure. But I think at, at this point, kind of like what you were saying, that no SIBOing is probably worse than any bad exercises themselves could ever be. And that's something I've noticed, honestly. Like, some people... Some people will come to you and they'll do they're they're open to whatever, anything that you have to say. Others will come to you and you can kind of tell this guy's a little bit hesitant. Yeah. And he thinks everything's gonna hurt him. And we have to kind of inch our way past that concept. And it's tough sometimes. I'm not gonna it lie. Is. Yeah. <laughs> and I think even if uh you are experienced nagging pains, mm -hmm. you can placebo yourself into saying no this doesn't hurt at all and you just go on with your workout you finish it and usually you end up fine like i know alan thrall made a video on that like three years ago talking about how he did deadlifts and his back felt a little bit achy but he just kept going at it dropped the load did more sets uh walked and next workout he was perfectly fine so sometimes like do something move you know right. well yes moving moving in some form or fashion is almost always going to be better than not moving 100%. and what you kind of have to accept is that if you want to get good at, at this, whatever we want to call it, you're going to have some pain at some point along the way. So, something's going to hurt at some point or another. The thing is, nine times out of ten, it's probably for no reason. And nine times out of ten, it goes away all on its own. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's funny how that works out, but it's true. Actually, I would say this, the longer I train, the less injuries and pain I feel, even I though I'm getting older. We accumulate experience and we make less mistakes. So right. we know when to leave reps in reserve. We know uh, not to overdo certain volumes on some movements. We're aware of stimulus fatigue. It, it's crazy how that works out. And I wish we would have known this stuff when we were like 18 or something. Imagine <laughs> the progress we would have made, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not only do you get, not only do you start to know your body better, but you also get smarter and you have years and years of experience that you can lean on, it, re it really does make a difference. Because, yeah, oh, yeah, I was uh, I would definitely say I was worse off in my mid-20s than I am now. And But the ironic thing is, like, I wouldn't trade that. I wouldn't trade that knowledge right. for that experience because it, it really is what led me down rabbit holes of course. that not only helped pull me out of it, 
but now help me pull other people out of it. So it's actually valuable, at least in a way. <laughs> Dude, you freaking nailed it by saying that. And that's why like our suffering that we go through, okay, it sucks when you're in the process of it, but in the right. end, it's like, you know what? I'm glad that happened. That that nightmare, right. it's, it's, it's benefiting everybody now. Right. So um, <laughs> on, the, um, on the topic of overuse, how do you personally go about managing that? Like with the information you have now, I'm, I'm sure sometimes you have a little bit of strains. Like I know you made a video on tendinopathies, but what are some generalized tips you can give for guys who are maybe feeling not the best on a given week? A lot of times it's going to be transient in my experience. I mean, obviously, depending on lifestyle factors and how hard you're training, but if everything is seemingly normal and, and relatively average, there's going to be downs, but you usually just kind of flow out of them naturally, organically. As long as you don't, uh, as long as when, when you're in a down tick, you're not like banging your head against the wall, trying so hard to get out of it that you do too much, then eventually your body just kind of moves moves out of it on its own, in in my experience. Um, now, if you're truly ending up in a in a point where you are like overtrained or, or just beat the hell up or whatever, and, and yeah. that could be for a myriad of reasons. That can be because of training stress. It can be because of life stress, anything, or it can be because of those two things intertwining in a bad way. Uh, that's when I'll I'll personally. I just take a few days off at this point. I won't usually <laughs> take like a week or anything like that, but I'll take a couple days, you know, just kind of get my bearings back about me. And then usually I will uh, switch something up. So what, one thing I've noticed is that only parts ever really seem to go stale at one time. The whole program never really just goes bad True. at once. So you have this this one bad apple, right? You pluck it out. And you put a new one in its place and then you work that one up and then maybe a few months later something else starts to go bad and then you just do the same thing switch out that one that one bad piece you know what i'm saying yeah i think uh too many times guys will feel pain on one little movement and they'll just stop <laughs> right. training completely so they'll skip upper body sessions maybe only train legs and it's like do you really have to do that or is there some exercise that can be performed that would work around this and probably even get you stronger Right. At what you were normally going to do in the first place. So maybe bench press doesn't feel the best on a certain day, but you could have done weighted push-ups with neutral parallettes, you know, and then right. that extra serratus activation, just you moving everything freely. Next time you go bench, there's no pain whatsoever. Yeah, there's there's almost always something that you can do. And those regressed exercises. So here's kind of what I used to overlook, like. It was kind of if I can't do if I can't do something that I consider a primary movement, then I'm wasting my time. Right. Right. Now, the way I see it is, no, th those are all they all create little bridges. They all everything nudges you along. So, like, as long as you can do something, it's always going to be better than nothing, even if it's one set. You know, even if, OK, I want yeah. to go, I wanted to bench two, 250 for five sets of five, but my shoulder hurts. So now I, I can only do one set of push ups, right, with a 45 pound plate on my back. That's still better than nothing. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it develops that warrior mindset that you are going to overcome the odds that, right. you know what, I'm a bit banged up today, but screw it. Let's let's do something. And it just makes you less lazy overall. My less opinion. lazy and I, I think also less susceptible <laughs> to those sorts of sh of pitfalls. So like to, to the idea of my body is fragile, right? Instead, True. okay, I can handle this. So now I know that my body is not fragile. And that's yeah. probably one of the most important lessons that you can ultimately learn by doing this kind of stuff. 100%. It's all about um, mindset development. Right. So on that topic, you talked about nocebo mm -hmm. in regards to injury prevention. What about strength and genetics? Do you see guys who talk themselves down or just fall into the rabbit hole of thinking they're not good enough, that they're going to be stuck with certain numbers for life, they're, they're going to be in novice purgatory? Like, uh, <laughs> what, what are your thoughts on people who overly obsess about their own genetics? I made a video kind of kind of on that topic last year when you were having that that whole thing oh, yes. upset. Um, and what I called it was obsessing over genetics is a fool's errand. And the reason for that is because it, it, it doesn't matter. You can either have the best genetics 
or the worst genetics, the only way to realize any of it is to just stop worrying about it. Put put your head down, do the work, and you're going to get where you're going to get. But if you're constantly obsessing about your genetics, it doesn't really matter how good they are. You're always going to be stymieing your progress. So the best thing that you can do is to just throw that out, discard that concept, in my opinion. Just stop worrying about it. And, and obviously there are discrepancies in terms of how one person versus another is going to respond. But like, just, What's you know. Change? You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like we're, we're born – with a certain body it is what it is we can't change it all we can do is optimize our training and hope for the best right because uh you know i'll hear some guys they make these extensive videos talking about all the genes and i mean it's cool to learn from a scientific standpoint but what the f is that going to do in your training it's a waste of time over obsessing about this stuff and what if you find out you don't have those genes that's <laughs> being described and now you actually screw yourself over mentally yeah you now no, i'm not going to make progress oh i'm yeah. genetically doomed to not <laughs> exactly. make progress now it's yeah. So that that's kind of the thing. Like that's kind of what you're saying. The problem is that it's cool, but it can't really help you. It can only hurt you. It can only hurt you. That's the thing. <laughs> Unless you, you match up with all the, the good traits and now you right. will yourself to go even beyond. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. <laughs> but what are the odds of that? <laughs> hey, you never know. But actually, I always <laughs> said that if you're someone with good genetics, you would know. You These people aren't on YouTube making videos or looking for advice. Like, Right. They're those freaks in the local gym that just get big, you know, and strong. Right. And then they, they have a random Instagram profile. They're in their uh, basement or something, and they're putting up, like, world-class feats of strength. <laughs> yeah, they don't even know what powerlifting is. Yeah, <laughs> Exactly. But I think, you know, there's also value in perhaps not knowing what certain standards are just because you're going to push yourself to the extreme. For example, weighted calisthenics. It's become more popular in recent years, but back then there weren't a lot of guys really representing it. And... As a result, the people who did do weighted calisthenics didn't know what the standard was going to be. And right. most of those guys ended up putting up some really amazing numbers, like three, four plates on weighted pull-ups, five plate dips. And it was, no, it was only like years later when more people got into the scene that people were doing like six or seven plate dips and going a step beyond, which I know is hard to imagine. But, you know, if someone sees like such a huge number – that might be like so far that I'm not even gonna, uh, I'm not even gonna get there. So many times it's good to just be on the journey and don't mm -hmm. even worry about the results. And that's kind of where I'm at with my training. I never focus on the end goal because like I have goals, but I don't care when they're gonna be reached. You know? Right. Yeah, I kind of had that run through my head yesterday. Actually, that that same kind of idea. I did push presses, ended up being a pretty shitty session. And you're sitting there and you're like, well, I just did this last week or two weeks ago or whatever. And now today I did this. I know I'm not weaker, but I sure feel weaker. And I felt like I was this close to my goal. Now I feel like I'm this far uh. from my goal. <laughs> and so it's like it, it is better to just kind of put your head down and just let the let it let it sort itself out in the end. U ultimately, if you're doing the work that you know you should be doing and you're doing it consistently, you're going to get there. It's consistency. You know what? Maybe maybe you'll have one month out of year that's just complete garbage. You don't make any gains. You're feeling all banged up. But then everything else is fantastic. So right. the big picture is where it's at. And actually, this has probably happened to you, but you'll have a week that's like terrible. You know, you're, you're weaker at everything. And then the following week, even without a D-low, all of a sudden you're putting up lifetime PRs. And it's like, what the hell happened? But <laughs> it, it does. That's why it doesn't matter. <laughs> the like the day to day is the accumulation. But right. it's not the absolute. Yeah, the, the individual sessions themselves actually become irrelevant when you look at the bigger picture, when you look at the fact that this whole process is something that you know is going to occur over several years, especially the more that you do it. Something that was a six-week process before might be a fucking six-month process now. Yeah. So eventually you realize that the individual sessions themselves are somewhat irrelevant. and. It, you yeah. also realize that the the down ticks are inevitable as well. <laughs> yeah, it's just it's part of the game. So right. then um, for you, I know there's some movements that you've been training for years and have made progress on and are still making progress. What are some noteworthy PRs that you've acquired recently? Uh, 
So I told you about that chin up. I did the 150. Um, prior to that, my best was actually now it's not gonna sound that big. My best was only one was 145. So this time I did 150, but I am personally about 15 pounds heavier now. So it's it was, more impressive. Felt and pretty good for me. Probably weren't peaked either to top it off. Well, it was through the conjugate training. So I was just kind of honestly, exactly. it just kind of went like that. Yeah. And then I, did, I hit 150 and I just kind of stopped doing it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I did um, some solid high pulls in recent history. I hit 315 for a triple. Yeah, and then how I long was pretty, the duration to get to that amount? The high pull? Yeah. Uh, so I've been, I've been doing that exercise for several years, but I've been kind of on and off with it. So I started really doing it, I think it was like 2018. And it was because... So I used to do Olympic weightlifting, at least uh, I used to mess around more with Olympic weightlifting. I started looking for ways to simplify that, just make it as as easy as possible. Because what I noticed was when I was decent at it, I had to do it all the time. It was so technically dependent. If I took a week off, all of a sudden I I suck. I lost like 25, 30 pounds on my on my lifts. So I started looking for ways to just kind of dumb those lifts down. And I got to the hang, I got the power cleans and power snatches, then hang power cleans and hang power snatches. And then I settled on the high pull. So I kind of use a mix of them all now, but with the, with the high pull specifically. So I started doing that in like 2018. Uh, I, I ran with it for a little while. I did it. I think I kept it in, in 2019 and then I kind of pulled it out of my program for 2020. And then in 2021, I kind of got on and off with it. And now I just kind of put it back in maybe a month ago. And I'm I'm heavier now, so I'm carrying a lot more. I've I've just got a lot more oomph to carry behind me, to behind my efforts. And so I've really noticed that that has kind of started carrying over and the wow. number climbing up. I'm I'm surprised that the weight gain would make a, a difference for something like that. Because you would, <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, I want to ask you about bulking because uh, <laughs> in some of your older videos, you were literally shredded to the bone, man. Like right. <laughs> insane. And great aesthetics too. Like I think people don't realize that underneath the strength athlete is serious muscle. And all you got to do is reveal what's always been there. And it was the same for me when I went from bear mode to, you know, being 146, 150. Like, yeah, I saw that. We all, got, <laughs> we all got the aesthetics. So right now you're, you're rocking a, a slightly fluffier state. But you say that your lifts are more impressive and you look bigger than ever before. So – can you compare and contrast the differences in being single digit versus say 15% body fat as an actual natural? Uh, I think one of the main things is, so I, I didn't necessarily feel it as much at the time when I was peeled, but in retrospect, I feel like the ability to <clears throat> strongly brace is, is lost. So this is purely conjecture, but I, I look back some, on some of that footage sometimes, and then I, I kind of pair up what I see on the video with the numbers I was moving, and I'm like, yeah, you couldn't fucking – you couldn't <laughs> hold yourself against the weight. You know, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I have a hard time articulating it, but now I go and I do a, a heavy squat, and I, I don't at all feel like I'm going to cave over under the weight, either like a, my legs can do it or not but my torso is strong and rigid. I think that is probably the biggest the biggest thing that I've noticed between being lighter versus heavier. Yeah, a lot of people will say the same thing, that the bigger their gut gets, the better their <laughs> squat becomes <laughs> because they can kind of use it as leverage, press against it. And even when you have your belt on, you got all this bulge. That right. helps you. <laughs> but whereas on deadlifts, it seems to have the opposite effect. You want to have less gut. This way you can use a a narrower stance on, say, conventionals and get a better deadlift. And that's why um, a lot of the lighter weight classes tend to pull sumo, but the super heavyweights won't do it in most cases because they physically can't. They got too much mass in front. Yeah, it impedes positioning. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So you notice bracing was an issue. What about looking back at it now? Energy. Do you feel like there actually was something significant there or not really because you were in it for so long that you adapted, like realistically? Interesting with somebody like me, I don't know that 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 would be a, a level of leanness that most people should try to get to. I didn't really do it on purpose is kind of the funny part. I, I just okay. kind of stumbled into it 
it, it just based on, I, I guess, the way that I was eating and, and the way that I was training, I just kind of started dropping body fat. Wow. Uh, and not, not that I like right now I'm, I'm carrying more body fat than I was carrying like before that, before I got to that ultra lean state. I think I had always been just naturally walking around like maybe 12 ish percent. I'm not, I'm not an expert on gauging body fat, so I'm not entirely sure if I had to guesstimate like 12 ish percent. And then I don't know what, what would you say I was when I was like sh- in those, sh- in that shredded state, like e- easily 8%. 8%. I think you were uh, like the same as me. <laughs> that's <clears> yeah, that, that's kind of what I was thinking. And I just kind of, I, I didn't force myself into that state. So I didn't really feel that I was lacking energy, Okay. but I, I think that it did impede my strength not only my where i was like strength wise but my ability to build strength while in that state (laughs) right so then you would say that your progress really improved when you started eating more food so it's not that it wasn't possible to make gains just that it wasn't at the same rate right i think so yeah um yeah i think that's what gets lost with this conversation of uh main gaining or just bulking versus cutting going through certain phases like that it's not that we're saying it can't be done. It's just like, why would you if it's inferior? Sure. So you're trading aesthetics for, you know, potentially more muscle gains and performance in the long run. Right. Yeah. I think I think that's good trade off. <laughs> it does depend on what your goals are, because like, <clears throat> if you're more athletic based as opposed to strength and hypertrophy, then a certain body fat might start to impede your ability to move, move as well as you want to move. And it does depend on the sport. So like with me, for example, when I was super lean, I had no, no body fat weighing me down. Right. So I was flying. I hit, that was the highest I could ever jump in my life. Um, And I was already North of 30 years old at that point, but I was jumping higher than ever. So then now I'm not, I'm not as lean. I can't jump as high. I can tell, but I can still, by training, like sprinting was what I did last year, I can still run pretty fast. So like I can run faster than I could run right. in my younger years. So it it depends, basically, is what I'm getting at. If I, I guess sport, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry to cut you off. <clears throat> I, I guess it's not that you're losing those performance benefits. It's just that it's being masked by the extra weight and it's physically right. not possible for you to do it in this state. But if you were to return to being single digit, then yeah. that, that jump would come right back. No, that's a good way to, to think of it. You're not you're not losing it. It's being masked. I think that's yeah, a good Yeah, yeah. Well, um, from my experience, it was the same thing with uh, one-arm pull-ups. Uh, I was doing a lot of weighted pull-ups in a heavier state. And then when I cut down, without doing any training for them whatsoever, like zero specificity, I repped out six, no problem, which was <laughs> a, a lifetime PR. But the thing is, the muscle gains were already there. It's just it wasn't right. possible to express it at a higher body fat and right you know calisthenics for me went up but other exercises went down like i noticed in particular posterior chain went to absolute hell right (laughs) but everybody's different you know you don't know how you're going to respond in those zones no and the best press that tends to be the biggest one for most yeah i did a powerlifting meet a few years ago um ended up being one of my worst ones actually so i did I did try a pretty big, uh, or no, no, no. I, what I did was I didn't water cut because I had failed okay. the water cut that one I was telling you about. So I cut weight over the course of the like peak as I was preparing for the meet. Basically, my bench just, just mm. tanked. I lost like forty pounds on my bench in like a Shit. few weeks. Wow, oh, that's <laughs> fast, man. But that means it must also. I did uh, a really bad job, but. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it also comes back pretty fast too, yeah? yeah. And I think that's what what people don't realize. Uh, when you go through these aggressive cuts, sure, it sucks initially, but the moment you start eating a bunch of food again, within like two to three months tops, you are back and rolling. Right. No, I agree. It does come back pretty quick, especially the higher the higher that you have made the ceiling, the quicker I feel you're gonna you're gonna start to bounce back. Exactly, and in general, uh, it takes a lot to lose natural muscle. Like you have to literally do nothing. And even then it's impossible to go back to a novice stage. If you've already put in like a decade of training, like you, you will never squat 135 again, as far as I'm (laughs) concerned. (laughs) 
No, I think that I would have to probably be pretty close to dying to literally to that week. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, I what I can't remember what it was. I had been I I came across this. Uh, it was a I don't remember a research paper something, and it was talking about how uh, some, somebody told me the term for it. When you do something like this, like weight training or or physical training for a long enough period of time. You literally are changing the organism. You're not yes. you're literally a, not the same person that you were when you started. And the part that blew my mind was that by adapting your own body, you will literally, if you were to have a kid, pass that uh, evolved set of genes onto the child. So you're literally passing, passing uh. different, I don't know if it's genes, <laughs> I don't know what the word is, but you're passing on different traits than you would have if you had never lifted or gotten stronger or whatever. And that just, that part just blew my mind. <laughs> that, that is the coolest shit ever, you know? And maybe that's why <laughs> some sons do better than their fathers in terms of that's, bodybuilding. That's like, true. like my dad used to do uh, bodybuilding, not competitively, but when he was young, that was his thing. Uh -huh. And he was actually bigger than me, to be honest. But now I find that I'm a lot stronger than him and I've surpassed him on pretty much everything. So right. I don't know if it's that or I'm just making it up right now but anyway there's uh <laughs> there are permanent physiological changes and even uh with the the satellite cells the nuclei that's what muscle memory really is right because you have like megan always says from team 3d alpha you have more workers in your muscle cells so when it's time to uh train heavy again you just rebound very quickly this is also why they say if you take steroids once you'll never be natural again because you permanently impacted the nuclei in your muscle cells, and there are physiological changes that already occurred. So right. you cannot be the same. It's not going to happen. But I, I do respect those who return to what I believe is the proper way. And I still think that, you know, even though there's permanent changes, they won't be like their former self. And the numbers that they do achieve are probably achievable naturally, to be honest. Like I know Pete Rubish is doing really well right now, and I think he's around like a, a 680 deadlift, something like that. Yeah, uh, which you might say, oh, it's because he took gear in the past, but I believe he already pulled over 700 when he was younger as a natty. So he's not even back to his former natty self. And on that topic, if you wanted to, it, it would still really depend on how long somebody had been doing, doing the gear. And even if they were doing <clears throat> what would be like where they're never coming off versus if they were cycling it, I think that would even impact if somebody were to come off permanently, what kind of what kind of gains they would make? I, I, the way I would see it is, the higher you can take it while you're doing it, the higher that you'll be able to keep when you come off of it. You know that what makes I'm saying? Sense. I wanted to backtrack a bit. Okay. We talked about hypertrophy, the importance of the importance of it for uh, you know raising our strength potential and all that. What is your general approach to getting big naturally? Because I've heard you say the quote. Correct me if I'm wrong. Form follows function. What's up with that? Uh, I still mostly believe that, um, especially in a natural lifter, <clears throat> a natural lifter. I don't think you're going to find somebody who's carrying appreciable muscle size who isn't capable of moving a decent weight. So, like, if I wanted to have a big chest, even if I don't, even if I don't bench press, right? Mm-hmm. If you put me on the bench press and give me four weeks or six weeks or whatever, I'll be able to move a decent bench. So like the hypertrophy comes is not going to reach that point of being capped because the ability to produce that force exists. You know what I'm saying? If that yes. if the ability to produce that force didn't exist, regardless of what exercise you use to create it, you wouldn't be able to build that level of muscle, at least nothing impressive. Yeah, it's the tightest correlation we found, and the right. research is constantly showing this uh, to the point where people even debate using advanced periodization strategies to begin with. They're saying just get big, and then with a, a little bit of specialization, you're already going to put up some crazy numbers. Right. And there is some truth to that in the sense that if the cross-sectional area is enhanced, then you will produce more force. It just is what it is. And just because a guy maybe does a lot of uh, – Machine chest pressing, mm -hmm. okay. He's not a bencher with a barbell, 
but what's he lifting on that machine? Right. It's probably not weight. And <laughs> like you said, you give him a bar for a few weeks, he'll do fine. He, he's not going to be a novice, basically. It's not possible. Right, exactly. Now, the problem you run into there, <clears throat> and it's going to depend on kind of if that person is natural or enhanced, the problem you run into there would be the stabilizer muscles aren't getting mm, aren't yeah. gonna be hit. So one thing that I, a way I like to look at it as, I think I talked about this in a recent video, there's like a, <clears throat> there's a continuum essentially. So if all I did was machine work, eventually as a, in my opinion, eventually as a natural, I'm going to be capped because my body will not give me more frame size without the ability to stabilize that force production, without the ability to stabilize that extra mass, right? So if all I do is machine work, event, I'm gonna build what I'm gonna build, and then I'm gonna hit a, I'm gonna hit a ceiling at some point. If we flip that, if all I do is, I don't know, freaking push-ups on a BOSU ball, I'm, all I'm doing is working stabilization, essentially. I'm, I'm shortchanging the prime movers. So I'm not going to build mass in that case either. <clears throat> Put us in the middle, you get, well, a little farther along the spectrum, you get like dumbbell work. And then a little bit farther along, you get like the barbell. And so yeah. you kind of work that medium ground the most with the barbells and the dumbbells. That's going to be the major sweet spot. And then obviously you can incorporate stuff from either end of the spectrum. But that's kind of how I see it, like a, a huh. stability continuum, so to speak. That is a very interesting perspective that I've yet to see anyone discuss before. And uh, <laughs> yeah, when I think about it too, even with calisthenics, uh, I found that by implementing gymnastic rings, it's helped my regular bar work quite a bit. And uh, sometimes you can get a different movement pattern um, through stabilization movements. Right. With a machine, I think in order to surpass this cap that you're talking about, you'd have to use a boatload of machines in order to get all the different arm path and hit the muscle from every angle you can possibly imagine. But if you're not doing that, <clears throat> then a free weight of motion where you could manipulate the joint angles a bit more is what you need. But if you can't stabilize, then you won't reap those benefits. So I think that's where, you know, we can distinguish these factors. And so maybe that's kind of what happened for you. Maybe you had plenty of force production potential from the prime movers themselves, but you needed to hit those stabilizers a little bit harder. And once you brought in the rings, you shored them up a little bit and that kind of boosted you just in general. Yeah, man. Possible. Um, and, and even what's cool about gymnastic rings. Actually, do you uh, use them at all in your workouts? Uh, I have a pair. I've messed with them, but I'm uh, I'm I'm not gonna say <laughs> that I've done it consistently. So yeah. <laughs> well, look, I'm not into uh, like the advanced skills and stuff like that, but I use it for hypertrophy and mm -hmm. changing the direction of resistance. And what I could say is, if you use max effort variations on the rings, it's gonna help. You know, like weighted pull-ups. Because the straps can be diagonal, you can manipulate your hand placement. It just gives you more variety. In general, it's easier on the joints as well. In my opinion, it makes you more um, injury-proof, especially for things like golfer's elbow. Right. That makes sense. Is that all? Have you done uh, – You so have you only been doing the chin-ups or have you been doing uh, press uh, Even uh, even weighted dips, uh, they're very freaking hard. And it's going to take some time before the numbers get close right. to your bar version. But it is doable. And I have seen that with uh, McCannimal. He did like a 235 pound weighted dip on, par on parallel bars. And now his ring dip is like at 185 ish. So the gap will close over time. And when that does happen, like that's when you can really excel uh, for hypertrophy work because you're not being limited by the stabilization. You know, stabilizers. find also that push ups on rings are fantastic because you can fully bring the arm across the body. So it's a more athletic way instead of using cables or those converging type of machines. So I think that would be to your liking and even doing chest flies on rings if you right. so desire and you could do it from a home gym which would be nice so have you been using them primarily um as just the same kind of concepts you would use for your regular weighted calisthenics just just as the just to try to bridge that gap bring the two closer together so bring like the regular dip closer to the ring dip kind of thing yeah. that, that's one philosophy but uh Honestly, man, I, I view it more from changing the joint angles and minimizing overuse. Okay. And, and then just being better for hypertrophy because right. uh, you can emphasize the shortened position with rings. And it, it's not the same because with a bar, it's it's just straight up and down. It's all you can really do unless you're like twisting your body and, and trying to make it more unilateral. But 
because the rings are independent and you can set up the straps however you like, it really is not the same movement, even though it looks similar. <laughs> but uh, that aside, talking about weighted calisthenics, mm -hmm. what do you see, what, what is the value of them for you? for just raising general strength and being more complete? Like, why do you choose to do some of these movements as opposed to being a, a barbell purist? Uh, I think they're fun. That's the main reason, <laughs> uh, honestly. So like, you'll see a lot of benchers, a lot of, a lot of good benchers will use dips um, as an assistance for their bench press. I didn't, I've never really found that the dip is an ideal assistance movement for me. Like I can get really strong at the dip and my bench might not necessarily go up at all. Um, so I just, I like them. I do it for fun. Honestly, that's the, gotcha. that's the main reason with my, with the chin up, you know, my it's obviously it's helped me build pretty big lats. Um, yeah, so that's, cool. that's cool too. But I mostly just, uh, that one, that one I like because it's, uh, you know, if you got, you can do all these pressing exercises, you got to be strong at some form of pulling as well. Yeah, uh, for the dip though, I just like it. It's just more, just more fun for me. I actually enjoy dipping more than I enjoy bench pressing, to be perfectly honest. That's cool. So then, a few things about that for the dips. Would you <laughs> say that it's maybe improve your injury prevention to a certain extent since you're getting a really deep stretch in your pecs? That's definitely and therefore strengthen the tendons. That's definitely possible. That's something that I was actually tinkering with when I was doing them last summer when I was doing the conjugate style. Uh, so I had started doing a lot of extreme range of motion dips basically dipping as far as i could i was doing one where i was starting from the bottom just starting in as deep of a dip as i could and doing a bottoms up dip and yeah. then i was doing one where i was just going as low as i could and just pausing just holding mm. so i did like man i'll try to find, i can try to find the video but i got i can get pretty deep like that and i held uh like three plates like that for like five or ten seconds and it was <laughs> man that is brutal it was hard just holding was harder than actually dipping myself back up so wow. there's, there's that's probably there's got to be some merit to that to the uh I, tendon thing i i do believe there is and for the pull-ups uh, so you got bigger lats from it obviously uh, would you say it, it's helped your deadlift in any type of way from getting stronger at them uh that i'm not sure of i you do need you gotta you gotta know how to use the lats and and having strong lats is going to be part of that for keeping the bar in nice and snug while you're deadlifting but i don't know that chinning i don't know that i would say that chinning itself is going to carry over directly into a deadlift it's just kind of one of those things where you got to be able to do chin-ups you know like if i'm in oh yeah this, <laughs> I mean, you gotta be able to do some damn chin-ups. <laughs> damn right. Otherwise, what the hell are you really doing? <laughs> yeah, and, and like you said, it's fun to do as well. Uh, well plus, it, it works. Like, like why not? You know, I, I see guys that they can't even do ten pull-ups. Yeah, they're doing full-blown back workouts, like with cables and stuff like that, which there's nothing <laughs> wrong with. But why not just learn a basic move? You're, you're gonna get the same stimulus and actually get better at something that'll serve you in the long run. Well, that's the thing. When you're good at that. When you're proficient chinner or master chinner, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> you can go and you can do any of that other stuff, exactly. you know, and you'll be good at it. Yeah. But if all I'm doing is those machines or whatever a traditional bodybuilder back workout may be, and I'm ignoring things like the chin up and I can't do chin ups proficiently, the inverse is not going to be true. So exactly. it's kind of just like a, even from an ROI perspective, why would I not get good here, which is going to carry over to everything else? Exactly. It goes back to uh, training economy. On that topic, I want to ask you your thoughts on <laughs> stimulus to fatigue. Okay. Are there certain movements you program because they're just so darn good on recovery? What would they be? Your go-tos for just getting generally big and strong, but not feeling beat down. So if we want to look at legs, so or quads, I guess specifically, I think my favorite is going to be the belt squat. Hands down. Yeah. <laughs> uh, beyond that, I like the goblet squat. Um, I'll do like a heels elevated style as well, the way that uh, you'll see like knees over toes guy doing. Um, you can throw machines in for that kind of thing if you have access to them. Uh, for like, for lats is my other big one. So for that, can't really go wrong with pull downs. 
Um, I actually bought a set of those. I can't remember what they're called. Those like uh, the Mag Grips there. Yes, yes. How, how do you like it, those, by the way? I love them, dude. So they're awesome. They make it. They make it feel like ten times better. Honestly, like the, oh, and the strength curve just feels smoother. I don't even know why, but it just does. <laughs> so with that, you know, and then you've got a whole bunch of different types of uh, grip widths and grip styles you can use. I've got like multiple different uh, neutral grips now, and then. Uh, supinated and pronated and all that so i just like to mix in like that that works really well for chest push-ups man can't really push-ups. go wrong with push-ups uh <clears throat> at body weight or even at light weights if you're if you're moving through max range of motion and you're you're being sure to control the eccentric phase all that stuff you know it worked that kind of thing works really well you do um deficit push-ups as well right like you have the kenzie weight vest and i see you do like deep range of motion with that do you find that's another good way to uh get more or less weight and yeah, how, like- how's that helped you out with your bench press because you said the dips uh, didn't make a difference but this i would believe is more specific right so it's definitely more specific to benching i can't say like i'll even use it for a lot of clients as well i can't say for me specifically because basically i'm not re- i've not the last few years i haven't focused enough on the bench to match my bests what i did back in like 2016 time frame so <clears throat> i just can't say for certain based on that but just in terms of the ability to have a strong upper body just in general and, and nice joint range of motion because, like, shoulder mobility is something I've always yeah. been sure that I want to maintain, you know. So just from that perspective, I find it very valuable. Um, same with, like, those dips like I was talking – we were talking yeah, about yeah. motion dips. And that's one thing I've started doing a lot more of in, in recent history, not just uh, keeping my primary movements – but then adding in secondary movements where I'm using what I would consider to be a maximal joint. Right. Position, just kind of as an adjunct. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good way to program. And again, <laughs> it goes back to that knees over toes philosophy, but right. it's not about him. It's about just like maximizing the range of motion for every part of our body. Like why the hell not? You know, right. do deep, deep presses instead of partials, uh, maximum hip flexion. <laughs> uh, generally speaking, it tends to be better for size. And in general, you want to have the ability to move in all these positions. Right. It's, it's it, not only badass, but it makes you more complete. It does. It makes you more complete. It makes you healthier in the long run. It yeah. makes you feel better. And I do think it, it kind of optimizes that stimulus to fatigue concept that you were talking about, because in, in part because it forces you to use less weight, um, which, you know, just doesn't, yeah. doesn't beat the body down too much. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, um, what about back extensions? I see you do them with your home setup and you did like 175 pounds. Is that something you regularly uh, employ? And by the way, that's freaking strong because some people can't even good morning that. So <laughs> good work. Uh, so I love the back extension. Um, that one I had started doing a few years ago. Uh, I originally started, what I would do is I would bear hug a dumbbell. So mm. at my old gym, when I was still going to a gym, I maxed out what I could bear hug or, or what they had. It was 150 pounds. And I was like, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do three sets of 15 with this or whatever. So I worked my way up. I maxed out 150 pounds. That was all I could get at that gym. And then I kind of – I started working out at my home gym, and I was still using the dumbbell setup. Uh, I started experimenting at that point because it gets cumbersome. So I started experimenting. I tried yeah. holding a uh, an easy curl bar like in an isometric row kind of. Okay. And that was better. It was better. I ended up doing like 250 pounds like that for several reps. But nothing – now that I've done the barbell on the back version, mm. nothing nothing compares to that. That's like – that's yeah. the freaking king right there. So I, I do want to go back to that probably pretty soon and start trying to push that up a little bit higher. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a good uh, complementary motion for uh, Romanian deadlifts and good mornings. It's like a step like below that, but it just makes you freaking bulletproof in my experience. And I well, like to do it with 90-degree angle. And yeah. uh, it's definitely harder when it's up here versus you holding it down. Yeah. So it incre- the with the bar on the back, you get the uh, the longer lever arm. That's exactly. What yeah. Well, the reason I like the hypers, uh, the back the back raises. So like I, I enjoy an RDL. And I enjoy a good morning. But with the with the back extension, it's because the pelvis is planted because the pelvis is fixed. It can't move. So okay. you have to be hinging. You, uh... have, you have no choice but to lengthen the hamstrings right when you what because what you'll see a lot of times with a good morning or an rdl 
you'll start to see more and more knee bend, right? Yeah. Or, or even a chopped range of motion as the weight gets heavier and heavier. So that's kind of why that that's kind of what brought me made me fall in love with it, and, and it just felt really good, which is the other reason. Very interesting. So then, uh, what is your general approach to training the hip hinges? Some people like to do just heavy singles, triples, and fives on dead stop pulls, and then the volume work will be allocated towards RDLs and good mornings, or they'll just do like percentage back downs off the main work being more specific, and then like hit some accessories like split squats and stuff like that with reverse hypers. And I can go down a bunch of examples, but how do you like to program getting a stronger deadlift or just generalize hypertrophy training for the posterior chain with hip hinges? So I think if you are <clears throat> primarily trying to build the deadlift, you'll be better off doing the majority of the work in that first way that you kind of mentioned. So doing whatever you're working up to, whatever your top set of deadlifts is going to be, and then getting in some back off work on the deadlift itself, whatever your primary variation is. If you're a conventional puller, it might also behoove you to get decent at sumo pulling just for that complimentary sake. Yeah. And then in that case, I will use the hinges with the eccentric. So the the art, the top down ones, the RDL, the good morning, the back extension, I would keep them really light, uh, not, not really light, but like moderate weights and focus mostly on that eight to 12, that hypertrophy rep range. And it would just be as assistance. Now, if if the main goal is hypertrophy, more so than strength in the posterior chain, then I would focus more on the hinges as compared to the deadlift. So I actually, I, in, in a lot of my programs, I actually like to distinguish between deadlifts and hinges. Mm -hmm. So I'll keep them in separate categories um, because you get that eccentric with the hinge, which kind of changes things. And, and it's kind of where I was going. That's what makes it more beneficial for hypertrophy that you're still getting that negative phase. So if hypertrophy is the goal, I'll, I, I don't even think you really need deadlifts like, like regular conventional deadlifts or sumo deadlifts. I think you can just focus more on the hinge variations. Gotcha. And, and then just employ a variety of rep ranges. Exactly. Awesome. I appreciate the unbiased response. <laughs> so, <laughs> so then uh, on the topic of dead stop work, do you like to do dead bench, pin pressing? I know I've seen you do some uh, box squats to break up the eccentric uh, concentric chain. There's floor pressing. Like, how? What is your general perspective on working in these movements? Like, What are the major benefits? I think that when you they they're like i i call, I call it dummy strength basically okay so like kind of the difference between the technically proficient guy who can you know bench 400 pounds versus the guy who's just brute strength whatever mm. ugly ass form <laughs> it, so like the way with the pin work with the dead stop work i think you're more you're building that dummy strength is the way I like to look at it. And that's something I've started in – like I didn't really used to do too much of that. I've started incorporating right. more of it in recent history. So I've started using uh, Larson presses off pins is a bench variation I'm doing right now with a close grip actually. That's uh, super dummy. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that will be – like I'm increasing the range of motion with the close grip. We're going dead stop on the pins. We're not using leg drive. That is kind of in the hope of <clears throat> carrying over to my OHP, my overhead press um yeah i've been i started doing some pin squat variations so i've i've started doing zombie squats off the pins which I, that might even be one too many steps too far i don't know but that i tried uh, an ssb squat off pins for yeah. the first time this past week the box squat like you saw so i've definitely been incorporating a lot more of that obviously if you come from the deadlifting, like like the powerlifting school or the strength training school, you're already kind of incorporating that with the pulls, with the deadlift exactly. variations. So it's been good, though, to get kind of different exposure, different stimulus with the, the bench and the squat as well. That's really cool. You're just diversifying the dead stop element. Because yeah. why does it have to just be uh, on a deadlift hip hinge style? You know, uh, right. that's completely arbitrary. It is. And actually, the squat the squat variations have felt really good for me, to be honest. Um, yeah. Well, I'm sure they're easier on your, your hips as well, yeah? And that, that would be another reason why it would be good, yeah. You're kind of not uh, – you're killing that turnaround where uh, if you – you know, if I did too much volume, I would like in a regular squat pattern, I would probably still aggravate my hips to a degree. And I guess that's been part of the uh, the evolution, you know? Yeah, and I think it's also good for people who don't do dynamic effort. It gives you some explosive work. There's a static overcome by dynamic. That's a nice element to work in that 
is often neglected. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. So um, on the topic of explosiveness, okay. I know you do a lot of push presses. Yeah. And you have great goals for the push press. Why is that generally favored per se over strict pressing? Like, why do you love this variation so much? So I fell in love with that. It's uh, <clears throat> Glenn Penlay. I read an article by Glenn Penlay. Um, and actually, I use his one of his old Penlay barbells is what I do all my push presses on. Oh, nice. So, <laughs> so he called. It was an article about it was I think it was power cleans and push presses. And he called them the the athletes lift, and it was what he what the term he used was knock them on their ass strength. So that was kind of where I started falling more and more in love with the push press. Was it when I when I was kind of getting into Olympic weightlifting, and then I realized it's a whole concert between the upper body, the core, or sorry, the upper body, the core, and the lower body. It all has to learn to work in unison. So not only are you getting, you're building that leg power with the reps that you're doing, you're also building stability in the shoulders. You're building overhead sure. strength. You're building lockout strength with the triceps, pushing out that last bit, and then having to use the whole body to support big weights overhead. It's just, it's just really, in terms of universal benefit, it's just kind of unbeatable in my opinion. So it's very different from the strict press though. Like the strict mm. press, it, it's not you're not getting that that shoulder strength off the bottom at all at all i'll be the first to admit that you're completely bypassing that by using the legs so that's kind of why i like to use both honestly is they right you get the best of both worlds. Ways. yeah so so would you say that the push press helps lock out strength on strict pressing just because you're used to holding weights overhead or is that kind of overplayed that it's really its own distinct movement and i mean it's badass to hold weights over your head like that and you're building i think that it is a different type of strength so like okay. i don't think it's going to help me <clears throat> necessarily lock out an overhead press i think that's going to have for at least for me that's going to have more to do with how well i get the weight off my shoulders whether i yeah. lock out or not it's like having that ability though to support a big weight overhead it's a total body thing you know what i mean like it, yeah it, i think it, it's going to build up the the really the core and the and the hips in a stabilizing fashion that you can't really get elsewhere and same with the shoulders in a stabilizing fashion that you can't get elsewhere and, and having the ability to hold to hold a bar in that overhead slot in a, a heavy bar in the proper overhead slot that's also a skill in, in and of itself and True. that's going to keep the shoulders supple which is another benefit but what i've noticed is the strict press for me anyway ends up carrying more into the push press <laughs> vice versa the push press i would say i can take that anywhere and it's not going to do anything to the strict press but the inverse won't be true if my strict press goes up my push press is going to go up that is fascinating you know what <laughs> i think you might have convinced me to start doing some push presses <laughs> <laughs> no it's just uh, it's a great exercise just in general um, do um do you ever do them behind the neck or not really I, i've messed around with it a little bit it feels it, i've always just found it a little bit awkward I don't really know why, so I never really got good at it. But for some people, they can move more weight that way. Actually, a lot of people can move more weight that way. The reason being when the bar is on the back of the shoulders, it is already lined up with the hips. Exactly, yeah. When you're on the front, you got to get it up overhead and then back on, over top of the hips. So a lot of people can actually move more weight that way. If it doesn't bug, bug your shoulders, give it a shot. Okay. And do you ever do uh, variations of the push press, like with uh, the Swiss bar or the trap bar or even uh, maybe a Viking press? <laughs> With leg drive, or not really? press would be like the landmine, right? The landmine with the uh, attachment. So I think that would be fun, and I think there would be value in that. The Swiss bar or the trap bar, I'm not so sure, <laughs> Part, because it would be really awkward. Like what, kind of what you said before, the it's it's its own lift, right? So the push press, so. When you get good at it, you realize you start to find like little intricacies, little nuances that are particular to it. One of which is how you are keeping the bar racked on your shoulders. So like when I push press, when I strict press, I float. I don't even put the bar on my shoulders. Right. Push press, I have to. If I floated on the push press the way I do with the strict press, I wouldn't be able to get any power from my so legs into the bar. So you're relaxed? It's just resting on your collarbones? Like you're not even – it's resting on the front delts. It's similar to a front rack, front squat position, but a little bit different. I yeah. 
elbows downward a little bit more. So the yeah. way I go ahead. Sorry, I, I've I've seen some guys program it with the actual clean grip, uh -huh. and I, I just found it weird. Like, how do you press if your wrist is like this after? You know. So, <clears throat> I think, I, and this might be wrong. Like, if you're doing a jerk, it, uh -huh. it wouldn't be a big deal. You have to adjust the hand position. To, to actually catch the bar but because you're not pressing it wouldn't matter when you're push pressing so like if i'm front squatting my elbows uh parallel with the floor right if i'm strict pressing perpendicular if i'm push pressing i go 45 degrees okay so that gives me a blend of stability on the shoulders as well as the ability to press and finish it when the time comes gotcha so it's a little bit in terms of grip width, do you use a, a closer position or wider? Because I've heard people say that wide is easier to lock out, but you lose a bit of power out of the bottom. Or how how has that played out for you? I go a little bit wider on the push as compared to the strict. Um, it takes a little bit more mobility in the lats to get the elbows in that in that position that you want to keep it stable on the shoulders. But once you can get the hang of it, I think it gives you better uh, – it optimizes it a little bit more it it will still depend on the lifter like the the anthropometry of the lifter i have somewhat long arms like for my frame size yeah it's a little uh it's a little better for me to go wider somebody like you might want to might feel smoother with it a little bit narrower you also have really strong triceps so you might find that it's not a big deal at all anyway well thank you and i think it's true that at least from what i've seen longer arm guys Tend to better with a slightly wider grip on overhead press. Just something I've noticed over the years. Right. Yeah, that's typically how it is. Yeah. So uh, since we're talking about delts, uh, I know you've programmed Lou raises quite a bit, and they have been quite helpful in improving your size. So can you just give a quick overview to the viewers what it is and what the major benefits are? And actually, if you also go beyond just the plate version, like by using actual delts. Delt. So the Lou raise is basically a lateral raise, but instead of stopping here where the lateral raise, this is the finished position of the lateral raise, you just take it all the way through to the top. So <clears throat> you're taking the shoulder through a much, much bigger range of motion. Uh, it kind of, especially if you have a weight in each hand. So one thing I've started doing is sometimes I'll do it with one with weights in both hands. Sometimes I'll go unilateral. Oh, Unilateral lets me kind of cheat a little bit more. Uh. Have a weight in both hands, it keeps it stricter. So not only are you moving through more range of motion, but it ends up being a very strict pattern overall. It, it lends itself to high reps and just uh, getting that big big pump in the shoulders. Um, so it, it keeps them supple, keeps them healthy in the long run is the main reason why I like to do it. But I, I've definitely noticed some hypertrophy. Oh, oh 100%. Yeah, and, and would you say it also helps the overhead position? In a push press? Yeah, for sure. Uh, it's just because of the fact that as you're coming up, you kind of have a little bit of momentum. So it ends up, that weight ends up pulling the shoulder into a slightly more extended yeah. position overhead. And that's just going to help encourage it, encourage that area to open up, which yeah. is a big problem that people have with the, uh, the overhead position. One thing that you'll see a lot of guys do press weight overhead <laughs> and they never yeah they're they're inclined benching yeah yeah <laughs> I got it. everybody i talk to always reports the same thing that fucking <laughs> common form but uh actually the the high incline press is actually a really good anterior delt exercise right but it would it would almost certainly contribute to an overhead press and actually i think that uh so back in the day olympic weightlifting it used to be the clean and jerk the snatch and the clean and press so they still had to actually press a bar overhead. Yeah. It developed its own style. It wasn't quite the strict press like what we see today, but it required a lot more brute muscular strength than a jerk does, which is more power oriented or lower body power oriented. It involves almost no upper body strength at all. So what you would see is if you read some of that old timey, the, the old time training methods, they would actually bench with an incline that was considered a very good assistance exercise for the overhead press yeah yeah part of the reason for that's going to be you can't help but use your upper the, the upper area of the chest when pressing weights overhead the the natural kind of inclination is to lean back a little bit to help you get the chest more involved in the movement <laughs> that, that is very true and you know what um i don't do a lot of incline work mm -hmm. but i can still hit 315 and my upper chest isn't too bad i have to credit overhead pressing because right. it does work your upper chest a bit it might not be optimal but just to say, like, you're not going to have nothing, you know? No, so, I think it, it's, it's, yeah. so it's funny that you say that 
I uh, people always make fun of my chest size, but like <laughs> I I if I were to go through a period where I'm not bench pressing, so my chest is relatively unacclimated to work just general work, and then I do a lot of overhead pressing, my upper chest will my pecs will actually be sore from the overhead press wow. the, the following day. If that won't happen if I've been benching, like if the pecs are relatively exactly. conditioned. But it does show me that they're actually working pretty hard during that movement, dur- during the overhead press movement. At least for me, I'm uh, I'm obviously shoulder dominant, um, and one thing I probably could use more of is incline work, and I'm terrible at it. So I uh, tend I to. I feel you, <laughs> <laughs> man. Well, what's fun about the incline is you can maneuver the angles. It doesn't have to be 45 right. degrees. It could right. be 30. It could even be going on a flat bench and just putting some stall mats at the edge of it. So it goes ever so slightly up. And some guys actually do the reverse of that as well to get more of a decline motion, which makes it easier on their shoulders. Right. Yeah, I did have a client relatively recently who had hurt his shoulder before we started working together. And all he could do, he wanted to bench 405. All he could do initially was decline. He could not flat bench because the strain on the shoulder. So that, that is definitely a good way to ease that area up a little bit. So you got clients who want to bench 405. In that case, uh, would you say you deal with a lot of guys who are stronger than yourself that they come to you for advice? Uh, there have been several, yeah. Um, you know, it just depends. A lot of them see like a, a lot of guys see what I've done. You know, just even for my size, and uh, they see that I'm you know walking the walk, and that's good yeah. enough. For a lot of dudes. <laughs> well, I think that's what's impressive about you. Like you do have the results, and those numbers are excellent pound for pound. No one can take that away from you. And you've been grinding for all these years, never stopping, in your 30s, kicking ass, looking fantastic, embracing health. Like that's what the natural way should be about. And I think you're doing an an excellent job at showing that and keeping everything positive. Thank you. I appreciate that. (laughs) (laughs) So then um, I want to backtrack just a little bit. We're going to start wrapping up soon. Okay. What are some underrated exercises that you feel more people need to start doing like these three or five or however number you're going to say are just too badass besides the push press oh, damn it <laughs> <laughs> uh okay we'll say definitely the high pull uh the snatch grip high pull i don't think you can beat you're not going to be able to beat what you're getting from that upper back wise power wise and the hips just everything. naturally enhanced there you go naturally enhanced exactly i mean the thing about explosive stuff is it teaches you how to be aggressive, which is right. something you'll see a lot of guys, no matter how many times you say be, try to kill it, be as aggressive as you can. True. They just they don't they don't quite get it until they start just heaving Force weights them. around. Yeah. And then it kinda it kind of clicks. Front squats in general, I think a lot of people should try, at least try. With a clean uh, grip? I whatever. I don't even care. I okay. A, a clean grip. So where I was kind of going to go with that is I was going to say the zombie squat, but Mm. part of the benefit of the clean grip is the fact that it forces the mobility through the lats and through the upper back. So if you can hold a good position in a deep front squat, you're always going to have pretty much all the upper body mobility that you would ever need. You're never, you're never, at least through the the upper back, you're not going to be that, that guy that's a hunchback, you know? Which is important because a lot of guys are. <laughs> uh, but I like zombie squats is what I was going to say next. So just not not a different exercise, but still kind of on that same train because literally uncheatable as an exercise. So if you can hold, if you can squat up and down without even holding the damn weight, you're putting your quads are just you know they're getting trashed. You can't really beat that type of stimulus. It's, it's even stricter than an SSB squat because you can't do anything with the handles. Exactly. But, but would you say it's uh, safe to do over many reps? Like the form's not going to – it's not oh, going to fall off you or anything like that? I've never done more than five, to be honest. More than <laughs> and, and even then, if I'm starting to get heavy, heavy with it, um, <clears throat> it, it you'll start – you'll just – you'll lose the bar. Is And that's happened to me. I'm – going for a, a max a PR set of five, and I lost the bar forward on me on the fifth rep before. Okay. Um, I think triples are probably the sweet spot with that exercise, but I think that if more people actually focused on that type of thing, 
even in a secondary fashion, not, not even saying you got to do it as a primary movement. I think they would see carry over to their squat just for one thing, as well as just stronger legs and, and a stronger upper back. And kind of what we were saying, you can't have too strong of an upper back, right? Facts. <laughs> and then uh, um, for upper body, any movements you'd recommend? Like pressing? I have really been liking the Swiss bar strict press. And I know not everybody's going to have access to a Swiss bar, but if you can get a hold of one, it's both awkward as hell and smooth as hell at the same time. And I don't mm. really know why. It's awkward because it has to get out in front of you, but it's smooth with that neutral grip and it just feels nice going overhead. So that's something I would encourage people to try if they if they are given the opportunity to do so. And it's going to get you guys very strong because that's exactly what I did to get my 225 overhead press. It was mostly Swiss bar OHB because it was so freaking difficult that when you go back to straight bar, it's like, oh my God, I can stabilize this load with that much better. So it really right. builds that mid strength and the leverages are just pure garbage. Like you can't <laughs> lift as much, you know? Oh, I was just going to throw in belt squats, honestly. If uh, if you could swing it, that setup, I know that you showed a setup where you're standing on, on yeah. boxes or whatever. If you can pull that off, then I say go for it. You can't really uh, you can't really yeah. replace what that is doing. It just it nails the quads in a very, very unique sort of way. I don't it's hard nice. to explain. Like I've Man. done maker squats and then I've done like widowmaker belt squats, and it's just I don't know. It's it's just different. It's something you got to try. <laughs> They'll never understand until they give it a shot. Right. You know, and I, I used the ghetto method for uh, quite some time. And honestly, like, it was amazing. I absolutely loved it. But it did come to that point, like, around the 300 mark or a little bit below that, which is getting up is annoying. And then there's the balance component, too, because I used to do it without the hand support. Yeah. But I'm after not... that, I was like, nah, this ain't going to work, you know. But uh, you go pretty darn heavy on those and you hit it for reps like what's your your best uh 300 pounds for 30 reps or something like that i've done 250 for 30 i believe and then i've done 300 for 20 which i did that oh, pretty fun. recently um but that that is with holding on to it so you get you do get some support you know you're not you're not gonna fall yeah. off balance but what what i've noticed you can kind of it, it becomes kind of a similar concept as a hatfield squat true since you have the balance you can actually kind of lean back a little bit more on the hips. And I don't know, it, it doesn't really, it doesn't hit the hips. It's still trashing the quads. But for me, yeah. it, makes, it makes it feel really smooth, which is part of the reason why I like it. I guess what it is, is you're not really loading your rectus spinae. Like the torso doesn't contribute pretty much. It's just you're, you're sitting back more. And because you're still going to be lifting less, and there's no compressive forces, it doesn't matter because you're pushing your quads to failure or at least close to it. Therefore, the stimulus is high, but now you're able to grind through kind of those final reps. It's almost like a form of uh, accommodating resistance, like reverse band. You're going through all the joint angles, maximally straining, you know, and those will wreck your quads. Like if you guys never tried it, my God. No, it's different. And that's kind of the thing. Like you're like, okay, this 10th rep was really, really hard. But then you do another rep and it's just it it's always hard, but it's never so hard that you can't just kind of yeah, keep going. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Man. So uh, I want to ask you, what are some of your most important training lessons that you've made over the last five, ten years? Things that you wish you heard when you were younger? Uh, I think that the biggest, the absolute biggest thing to always remember is that a consistency you're never going to beat consistency and think big picture think long term for me it was always i want this yesterday and <clears throat> if i don't get you know if i don't hit the number that i want to hit here then i'm going to be in a sour mood for the rest of the day or for the rest of the week or whatever or i'm, I'm going to ruminate that kind of thing once you stop thinking so short term and you start realizing that it, it's going to be a process of accumulation of, of very long-term accumulation. You can kind of just be, be more at ease. I think be more at ease with the process. It's, it's just like it's adaptation on top of adaptation on top of adaptation is what, what ultimately leads to the impressive results in the long run. So I think that's really kind of big picture is really kind of the most important thing that I can hope to pass on to anybody because I, 
I got myself into some some issues by not thinking big picture. Mm. Being too uh, short sighted or wanting everything right now, and that, that leads to certain mistakes that maybe put you out of the game for a right. little bit, or you don't actualize your potential because it's just demotivating instead of right. just sticking to the process and eventually reaping what was supposed to be sold to begin with. Because right. it's it's all about showing up at the end of the day, and you got right. guys who don't even train in the most intelligent fashion, but they do the work and they're buff, they're strong, they're right. they're not any better than. Mostly watching right now. <laughs> they just showed up. And most serious lifters don't take too many days off uh, over the course of many years. Right. No, I think I, I, ultimately, yes, that is what's going to separate the, uh, separate the wheat from the chaff is the guy who showed up and worked hard for a decade is always going to beat the guy, even if it was dumb, is always going to beat the guy who did the best program on and off during that same period of time that 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 consistency and that hard work is not something that anything can replace yeah it is its own independent variable that's true so uh <laughs> with that said alec what are your upcoming goals for uh this year or just in general things that you want to achieve in the long term top of your uh, list so i think the main one at least, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get it done this year, but I think that the two main things that I want to do right now are those overhead goals. So I want to push press 300, and I want to strict press 225. Those are my two, nice. two main goals, I think. I also want to deadlift. So I want to deadlift 500 stiff leg off of a five-inch deficit. My God. <laughs> so I've done – I've been doing that every, like, third or fourth week. I'll swap – I won't do the heavy squat. And I'll just do a heavy stiff leg deadlift off a deficit. Um, <clears throat> so, so far, I've only gone up really easy 425. And then other than that, I've done a little bit of volume work. Uh, so I want to take that to 500. I want to push press three, strict press 225. And then I'm kind of putting the squat work. I'm just, I'm I'm rocking it. I'm pushing it hard. But I don't, I'm not like, I don't have just any big there. goals that I'm shooting for. Yeah. Uh, outside of that, probably just. Condi something conditioning wise this year i might i might try to do something crazy i had done i had considered for a little while i had considered trying an inman mile um which is 1.5 times body weight on your back barbell on your back walked for a mile without without putting it down i don't think i could do that mm. i think maybe maybe i could have had a prayer of a chance when i was like way lighter i don't think i could do it now Honestly, I think I could support the weight for as long as I need to. I don't think that my shoulders could tolerate holding a straight bar on my back for that long, but kind of along that same concept. So last year I focused on like speed goals, like sprinting. So this year I'll probably focus more on something conditioning. I just haven't really, haven't really come up with it just yet. Well, <laughs> that's uh, really awesome. You know, uh, you're just, you're getting stronger at some fundamental compounds right. and getting more conditioned in the process. And Hey, if you ever decide to, uh, get shredded to the bone again, imagine how your performance will raise even more. You know, those, <laughs> those long walks and stuff like that. But uh, anyway, uh, Alec, final question for today. I want to ask you, what is your final message for my viewers? Uh, something that could really help them out if they're either struggling with something that's going on in their life or they're just not happy with their current results in the gym. Try to put things in perspective, you know, like – I used to be the weight room, the gym, whatever. That was kind of, that was the one thing. That was the end all be all. So everything kind of was built around that. Not just like if this isn't going well, I'm I'm in a sour mood or whatever, but also like everything else that was part of my life was revolving around that. So I would skip whatever, skip a certain thing or not do something or or I'd have to be back at the gym at this particular time so I could do this particular workout that kind of thing. I think putting the whole thing into perspective is going to be very important because ultimately, at least for me, I didn't start weight training to be just a guy who was good at squatting. I started it so that I could take what I would get out of it and bring it to other facets of my life. And so that's kind of how I've tried to evolve in recent years. Not only like 
I'm doing this for the long term and I want to train for longevity, but I want to get the most out of the gym that I can bring into other aspects of my life. I think that's kind of uh, gaining that perspective is kind of a big, a big, important milestone. I love that, man. So you embody the gym lifestyle, but then you transcend it by letting <laughs> it affect other aspects of your life. <laughs> Very good. So then, Alec, uh, we are done for today. Uh, mm -hmm. If people want to reach you, where can they do that? Uh, so you can check out my website. My website's on KiraEliteFitness.com. Uh, my YouTube channel is also on Kira Elite Fitness. You can find me on Instagram. It's on Kiri underscore Elite. I think that's about it. That's the main main pieces, main parts. Fantastic. Well, uh, thank you so much for chatting up with me today. I really enjoyed our discussion, and I have no doubt that the viewers have learned a lot if they made it to this part. So uh, <laughs> just much love and wishing you continual success in building your channel and making all kinds of gains. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me on. I'd like to do it again sometime if you want. Absolutely.